Greetings, Race Community. Brent coming in live from beautiful McGregor, Iowa, where I'm continuing to work remotely for the next couple of weeks with my family. I am thrilled today to welcome Dory Sontag, who's the Associate Vice President for Organizational Effectiveness at Gonzaga University to the podcast. Welcome, Dory. Hello, Brent. I'm so glad to be here and just honored that you asked me to be a guest. This is going to be so fun. I have interviewed a whole bunch of folks leading various aspects of advancement organizations around the country, but I have only interviewed one associate vice president for organizational effectiveness. And I know you said I could shorten the job title. I'm not going to because it's too unique and interesting. So I want to get back into your history, the present, the future, but first tell me what an associate vice president for organizational effectiveness does. Yes. Uh, well, we were very intentional about the title. I have a very futuristic progressive vice president that I've been working with for quite a long time, Joe Poss. And we came to a spot where we wanted to focus a lot on our people. And so we really talk about the three P's with organizational effectiveness, our people, our processes, and our performance. And you can't have effective processes without great people. You can't have um, great people doing what they do without good processes and all of that relates to performance. So that's really what it's all about. I love it. There are not enough roles or titles like that in this field. As I just mentioned to you, uh, as we were going live, Ever Choose First Head of People and Culture that is very focused on organizational effectiveness. Gail Wilkinson just started this morning. So we're excited to be making some investments in the people operations realm as well. And so we'll for sure want to trade notes. So I want to come back to the three P's. But first, I have to know who Dory was as a junior in high school oh. at Billings Central and what led her to Gonzaga University. Who was she? What was she into? Was that an easy decision? Because you spent a lot of time there now uh, at this point. Yeah, well, you know, my big brother went to Gonzaga. I have three brothers. He's the oldest of my brothers. He went to Gonzaga. I had to follow in his footsteps. Um, money was definitely a factor for us. So I needed all of the financial aid that I could get. Um, and somehow my parents made it work. I contributed a little bit and then I graduated with some loans. So I chose GU um, just because of the great community. I saw how much it um, helped my brother get on his career path and just had to, had to follow. And, and, and so is Billings Central High, was that in Montana or? Yep, it's in Montana. It's a small, very small, I think I had 82 graduating in my class. Uh, it's a Catholic school. So Gonzaga is a Jesuit Catholic institution and it really uh, seemed to broaden my scope. So I, I was able to get to a little bit of a larger community without too large. Um, it really fit my, my uh, goals very well in that regard. And you studied psychology at Gonzaga. And that's just one of those fields that I don't feel like I ever could have thought to, like, I didn't even know enough about it as a concept, much less to consider majoring in it. Yet yeah. it's obviously critical in all aspects of, of work and life. Um, what sparked your interest in psychology at a young age? You know, I always had a passion for people. Uh, and, and really helping people reach their goals, um, their full potential, which is so much what we do in advancement, right? But who knew about advancement when I was a junior in high school? And I had a goal to become either a psychologist or a school counselor is uh, really where my path led as I went through college. And you completed the undergrad degree, but also were excited enough to continue to advance your higher education in pursuit of master's. Yeah. So I was working at an insurance company. It was my state work study job, actually, my senior year. Wonderful people gave me such a great opportunity. They, uh, I was pretty stressed about graduating with so many loans. Um, my boyfriend at the time, who's now my husband, also graduated with loans. Um, you know, not wanting to, you know, take on any more debt. Um, so I didn't go into uh, graduate school right after. I took the job um, at the insurance company that offered me a great job, salary benefits, the whole deal. And I was a life insurance agent, an associate agent at the time. 
And I knew that the only way to get further in any kind of career in psychology was to obtain a master's. And so I knew that there was the tuition waiver program at Gonzaga, because when I worked at another job, I had a friend who um, worked full time and also went to school. And so I looked into the program and found out they had a counseling program and thought I got to get a job because I can't take on any more loans. And uh, lo and behold, there were a couple jobs that I applied for, one in admissions and one as the administrative assistant in annual giving. And lots of reasons why I chose annual giving. The admissions job was a little too much travel for a newlywed. And so here I am now, 23 later at, at Gonzaga. 23 years later, administrative assistant, annual giving to AVP for organizational effectiveness. Uh, that is an amazing run. And so uh, from 93 to present is my, my understanding at Gonzaga in some form or fashion. Before we dive into those early years in the um, fundraising realm, anything we should know about during your time in life insurance? Are there common misperceptions or any lessons learned that <laughs> our, our, our audience should keep in mind about life insurance? Oh, goodness. Well, you know, I it's been so long. I do think that people shy away from it. It's hard. It's hard to talk about, just like plan giving, it's hard to talk about when you might pass away, but it's so necessary to have those plans in place. And so, you know, it's like any insurance policy. You may never need it. Um, because you may term out, but um, it's such a relief to have it in place. So I would definitely say, look into it if you haven't I, already. <laughs> I respect the plan giving uh, comparison. Um, interesting. So you are mostly seeking, it sounds like, a job that would help reimburse tuition for this master's degree so you can go and pursue those aspirations. Um, and you did complete the degree. So it's not like you immediately pivoted and felt like no advancement is my, is my path. Um, but tell me when you think about even those earliest moments where maybe it started out as just a job that would conveniently support, uh, uh, you know, your, your professional aspirations. When did you start to feel like, whoa, this is really, this is like really important work or when did it start to really connect with you and go beyond maybe being just a job? Wow, it, it actually clicked pretty early on. Uh, I found, you know, you discover so much about yourself in your early career days. Uh, you know, you're 22, 23 years old when you graduate and think you know exactly what you want to do, or maybe even um, you thought you knew what you wanted to do. And you just learn a lot about your strengths and talents. So what I learned about myself is I'm way more goal oriented than I thought I was. And, you know, the profession of a school counselor might not have brought that out in me um, as much as I thought and what I learned in my early days as, you know, an annual giving. So annual giving is so fun. It is the entrepreneurial arm, I believe, of the advancement shop. And that was so fun to me to be an intrapreneur, I like to call it, um, which is like really taking risks and being innovative and um, always looking at, you know, the best practices. So early on, I was able to actually like push our, even as, as an admin assistant, um, to push our team to try new things. So um, with, you know, summer mailing labels of all things. Do you, I don't know if you remember those when they were big, um, the big premiums but we had never done any direct mail pieces like that. We had never personalized, we had never put ask amounts, we'd never sent premiums, and we were able to test it out. And the return on investment was huge. So that was kind of my first um, spark, I guess. Of I mean, what you're, what you're hinting at, we talk about a lot, which is you know, the, annual get, the annual fund, um, first of all, the cycle is annual, right? So you don't have to wait years and years or decades for outcomes, you can test something and in a matter of, you know, now seconds or even days start to get real AB understanding. But um, I, I also, at the same time, I, I hear from a lot of folks that have struggled to really innovate with their annual fund, or they feel like we just have to sort of keep doing or tweaking what we've always done versus really, um, really innovating. And I know even in recent years, 
I mean, we caught up in May and, and, you know, this was not like the most people were worn out in general. Like the, the pandemic was, was sort of ending, but not, not quite yet. And I remember when we, when we caught up in, in late May of this year, your fiscal year ended in May. And the first words you said, I think, were we just had a phenomenal year. I'm like, whoa, like <laughs> phenomenal year. And so clearly there had to be pivoting and so forth this year. But even back to your time in that um, early administrative assistant role, you had the ability to test and, and try things. Was that leadership at that time or culture? Because not, I don't, I think there are probably a lot of administrative assistants in the annual fund who would say, are you kidding me? I can't run new tests or try new things. Yeah, we did. We had, you know, we had some pretty good leaders at the time. And I, I think that what I've learned in my experience in my past couple of decades is if you make a really good case and you show the potential ROI and then you deliver on it, it's easy for people to say yes to. So, um, and you're right. I mean, I think annual giving, annual fund work can feel like it gets stagnant. Um, but yet I look to the past of examples of every step of the way, so much of the world is changing, you know, bringing online giving in onto the table and um, PayPal. That was one of our latest over the last years is working internally to be able to accept gifts via PayPal. You know, so like, what's the next PayPal? And that's kind of my biggest fear is, you know, what do we, what do we not know right now that we should know? Um, but I think that's the exciting part too, is, you know, really trying, trying to anticipate and be strategically agile at all times to capitalize. Well, and with some of that agility and entrepreneurial work that you uh, were obviously able to execute on, um, you then got to lead the annual giving team. What point was it on that journey while you're still pursuing the master's degree, still doing the work right on top of your work <laughs> to become a school counselor? Did you start to think, you know what, maybe this could be my career uh, and not just my job? Yeah, so I thought I was only going to uh, be there three years. And uh, because I took on more and more responsibility, that became a little bit harder to do, you know, um, in, in terms of carving out time. And, you know, getting a master's in counseling is not easy to have to do as a full time job. Everybody else was mostly full time. There was a cohort model. I think I had, you know, five cohorts in my five years. And I had to, I, at the time I was managing our phone-a-thon program. So I think I had the role of assistant or associate director of annual giving. Um, one of my favorite jobs, by the way, is I still, I have the very best uh, friends from that experience. You know, now they are grown and they have families and great careers and some of my very best friends. So what a fun opportunity for anybody who's doing that right now. Um, so I had that role and needed to be very flexible. I had to do 20 hours of an internship um, plus my 40 hour a week job. I went to our associate vice president at the time and asked him if he would be willing to be flexible. Um, at that time, there weren't, there weren't the phone-a-thon schedules that there are today. I mean, I literally worked you know, 8 a.m. in the morning until 9 a.m. at night. There wasn't a 12 to nine job, which by the way, I, I did help change that because that's, you know, pretty hard to do, especially if you have any kids. Um, so we, I, he said, yes, he said, yes, we'll work with you. You know, I was, I was able to make it happen. I think it was about 60 hours a week I was doing at the time while pregnant with our first child, by the way, would not recommend that, but he said, you know, yes. And, and I just ask that you give us like at least a year, you know, we're investing in you. And so, you know, we don't want you to leave after that investment. And I thought, well, that's super reasonable, you know, and I will never forget, especially as we've gone through the last year with the pandemic, what that sort of flexibility meeting me where I was at and my goals, um, what that did for me. I mean, here I am now, you know, 23 years in, obviously I stayed loyal to that, but I think that was a pretty reasonable request. Um, I just love the work. I, I felt loyal. I love the people I worked with. And I was also a new mom, which, you know, my career changes were not going to be right at the time. So I always had the motto because everybody would ask, when are you going to be a counselor? You got this degree. When are you going to do it? And I always replied that, you know, when, as long as I'm happy, 
I'm not going to leave. And I was challenged. I love the people that I worked with and I love the purpose of the work. And I still am today. <laughs> love it. Yeah, it shows for sure. What is one thing uh, for those of us who haven't studied counseling uh, or, or an advanced psychology degree, what are one or two things that we all should uh, know that you think about with that degree, even though you didn't go down that career path that maybe you apply in, in how you go about your work today? Well, it's a lot of the on the job training that we get, um, you know, listening, open ended questioning or questions. Um, I think also the skill of um, of validating or confirming, you know, back what you heard, you know, paraphrasing. So all of those skills, especially with donors, you know, or even internally, honestly, you know, okay, so what I think I'm hearing you say is. You know, whether you're talking with a dean or your president, you know, to make sure, like, are we on the same page? This is what I think you said. Um, and you get a lot of, you know, actually, no, I meant this. Or um, especially with donors, you know, trying to understand where their philanthropic interests really are. Interesting. What's an example of an open-ended question that fundraisers should use more commonly? Oh, good question. Um, I think a question like what, what's the type of impact that you want to make with your, with your philanthropy? Um, another question is maybe given to the scale, trying to find the scale, you know, what, um, what scale of impact do you want to make? You know, talking about different options then that they might have. Um, we do a lot of work, um, we've done a lot of training with certain partners and we've learned even our own um, assumptions that we make, you know, so putting those on the table and not being afraid to go there. All right, there we go. Uh, so you said, as long as you continue to have fun, you would, uh, you would stay and, and, and stay loyal to Gonzaga. And, and here we are. Um, what is amazing about your background? I've interviewed a whole bunch of folks and it tends to be that there's some specialization along the way or that you get put on a track and then you go down that track. You have served as Director of Annual Giving, Director of Development Operations, AKA Advancement Services, Director of Development, uh, AVP of Development, and now you're leading organizational effectiveness for now almost six years. And so I would imagine um, given the end, starting as an administrative assistant, right? So you've, you've sort of seen the whole gamut um, from broad-based mass marketing, one-to-one -one fundraising, systems and data, which I think is when we first maybe got connected, leading a frontline team, I'm sure making asks yourself uh, now in this organizational effectiveness role. Um, so I imagine that gives you really good empathy, but also credibility with um, the whole org chart, right? I mean, I could see challenges sometimes where, well, I know you're doing this organizational effectiveness thing, but you don't really know what it's like in the annual fund or, yeah, but have you really done major gift fundraising? Like I, I imagine that helps you both get empathy, but also maybe earn respect um, from your colleagues. Well, I, I sure hope so. And you know, I, I definitely want to be someone that is respected and trusted um, and they bring so much to the table as well. You know, things evolve so quickly. So even though I ran reports and, wrote direct mail pieces and um, had ask strategies, uh, things change. So uh, I really learn a lot from them um, and really rely on the expertise and the niches that other people have carved as well for themselves. But I certainly hope that that's how people think of me. During your time in, in more of a direct fundraising role, whether that was annual giving or as a frontline fundraiser or frontline leader of front, frontline fundraisers, What's the, are there any gifts that really stand out to you as being particularly meaningful personally where it just really, you just really felt connected to the mission? Yeah, I, I have a few. One in particular though revolves around a student that passed away um, and I never was able to meet him, but his family contacted or somehow I, I was brought in when his family wanted to establish a scholarship. They were from the Denver area and this student wanted to go to Gonzaga so bad. He came as a freshman. He got diagnosed with testicular cancer sometime during his freshman year. Um, I believe he tried to make it back, but I think he only made it back for a visit. He was trying to do everything possible to make it back. And he never did. Um, he passed away. I believe it was sometime during what would have been his sophomore year. 
And there were a group of students from his high school that also came here. Um, He was just so well loved that the family literally on the one year anniversary of his death wanted to be at GU because that was a place that mattered to him. So they unfortunately didn't have the means to establish the scholarship themselves. Um, And so we were working and, you know, trying to figure out what we could do. And out of the blue one day, I received a phone call. At the time, our minimum for an endowment was 25,000. It's now 50,000, but that that time it was 25. And I can't say who or um, how, but an anonymous person called, obviously known to the family, and they offered to commit the funds to fund the scholarship. And it was the best thing to be able to share that with them. And they also came as well when he would have graduated to um, receive his um, diploma. And it was hard, you know, those are really hard times, but walking together beside people as they celebrate the life of their son that passed away and knowing that there really is a legacy forever um, in his name is, you know, one of the greatest gifts I think that I've had as as a fundraiser. So they also have a new year's Eve party. They've done it every year, even before he passed. And now they raise funds from that party to go to the scholarship. So it's, it's just been a real blessing. Wonderful story. Uh, Thank you for sharing. And, you know, just a reminder that um, it's that connection to a specific person uh, or impact story you know, whomever that anonymous person is that made the $25,000 gift, they had the $25,000 before he passed, but it wasn't until there's an opportunity to connect that capacity with specific interests or connection that philanthropy happened. And, and I think it's, um, it's just a great, a great reminder. Um, and, and as you then sort of think about the role now, and as we sit here uh, in mid mid 2021, it's uh, late July as we're recording this. You've already laid out your um, three Ps, but I'd love to go back there and just understand your point of view on um, the importance of just people operations, talent management, organizational effectiveness. Everybody knows it's important, but it's one thing to say it, it's another thing to commit to it um, and have resources uh, and, and, and investment in roles like yours. What's the biggest lesson or two that you've learned in that role over the last six years? And if there are uh, folks listening who are thinking about trying to invest more in talent management or people operations, uh, any pitfalls or, or, or um, things to watch out for along the way? Oh, boy. I, I think the biggest you know, advice is um, you've got to have a real understanding and pulse of the culture on a regular basis. And the culture has to, it's not just with one person. I think maybe that is one of the lessons I learned along the way. Sometimes I would try to think that I have the weight of the world on my shoulders to uh, maintain our culture and even enhance our culture. And that's just a, maybe a weak spot that I have, you know, sometimes trying to take it on and do too much anyways. But um, we created a, 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 a committee focused on culture and they helped us develop and enhance our, what we call our maxims, our values. Um, And they meet regularly to talk about our culture. And so I think the regular surveying, um, having people that are gathering together who care about it, who are willing to share unpopular opinions. um, I think, you know, being open as a leader to knowing that you're not perfect, you know, and we're not perfect and we'll, we'll never be perfect, you know, but not being afraid to listen and go there and then, you know, seek advice too and counsel and also say, gosh, I, I really don't even know what to do with this. You know, what, what ideas do you have? Um, and so really trying to help create that ownership within um, hiring as well. So every person that is a finalist on our team for a hiring um, role, we, I meet with them and the, The goal of that is I don't make the decision necessarily. It's not about final approval, but it's really about going over our culture. You know, here's our values and um, here's what you're going to see and here's what we expect. Um, So at least they hear it in that process. And then that's reinforced along the way when they come on board. I love it. It really does start with recruiting. And, you know, we've just gone through a couple of processes recently. And I think sometimes when you're, when you're in an interview process, it can feel like, um, a sales pitch in a certain regard, right? It's the candidate selling you and why they're great. 
or it's you selling the candidate on why this is the right role, but there's sort of this like convincing going on. Um, and, and I, you know, I, I'm just trying to reframe every hire as this is not a sales pitch. I'm not going to sell you on Evertrue being the perfect role for you. Cause I'm not sure. I don't know enough about you. We're just getting to know each other and you don't need to sell me that you're the perfect person for this role. What we should do during this process is try to figure out to the best of our abilities, is there a mutual fit? And if there is amazing, but if there's not, that's okay. Let's try to figure it out before you come join the company as opposed to finding out there's not a mutual fit shortly thereafter. And, and I think just trying to reframe it around mutual fit um, can maybe take some of the sales salesy aspects on both sides out of the equation. Yeah, I 100% agree with you. It has to be oh, the right fit because in the end, you know, you want people for as long as they can give you. You know, we can't always predict it'll be, you know, longer than three years. You know, that's something also that we've tried to not get so tied up in, you know, because sometimes you're like, oh, this person's only going to be here for so long. And yeah, that might be the case. You know, you can't predict that, but you hope they give it everything that they have while they're here and hope that, you know, there's something that keeps them wanting to stay. And as much as we try to de-risk it up front and find that mutual fit, um, we can only be so right uh, and things evolve. So there must be folks you've worked with where, and you don't have to name names, but you might have thought, no way they're here for more than three years, which maybe is how people felt about you when you joined, uh, given it, you might have said you wouldn't be there for more than three years. And then there must be other people that you thought, this is the perfect mutual fit. And it just wasn't, it just didn't work out. And the tenure was shorter than you might've expected. Are there any lessons learned or um, generalizable ways to, to, to think about when you get it right versus when we're off base? Um, Cause everybody's so excited on their first day at the new job. Um, but it seems like pretty quickly thereafter, you know, you can really hit your stride or else realize it's just not a fit. Gosh, I wish that I could say, I wish I had some sort of advice to give and, you know, what to look for. But what I will say is the onboarding process is so important and the regular check-ins. I, I think I went to a talent management conference a few years ago. I think this is where I got this, but I learned how important it is for noticing the little things, like things you should look at at like the six month mark have they brought things to their office and made it their own? You know, are their pictures up? That is telling you something that they feel comfortable here. If it's a year in and you don't see, you know, their, their personality in their office space, like mm, that might be a little bit of a red flag. So just, you know, not taking for granted that the onboarding ends, you know, after 90 days, but you know, how does a person feel after a year? or even a couple years and you know what happens now with the 3 year marks probably some time that you know some people are looking to grow you know what's the next step for them do we see a future path so really thinking about literally every person on your team where they're at and what motivates them to stay you know when you describe it that way and really when you think about the employee life cycle right how do we acquire talent onboard talent manage talent you know, provide learning and development. And, and then when necessary, either by the employee's choice or the, the organization's choice, how do you offboard talent effectively? Um, I think there's so much that we can learn around and, and apply that same philosophy to fundraising. You know, how do, we, how do we make sure that somebody's first giving experience is really positive, that they feel connected to the gift, that we're checking in with them regularly to get a sense of how they're feeling so that they don't um, churn as a donor the same way that we, we could churn through staff if we don't do a good job of that. It, it, do you find that to be the case that there are the same kind of themes? Oh, I think you're so right. And in fact, actually the way that we look at employee um, engagement is we need to start treating them like donors. Sometimes we're better at the external work and taking care of our donors than we are our own team. You know, So they need that stewardship and cultivation just as much. They need to feel the value of their work and their impact. So all of those things apply to both external and internal, for sure. So are you like the director of team stewardship? Is that like another way <laughs> to frame the work? I 
we actually have some really great people doing that work on our team. I think that a lot of them. So what is that. people, what is people stewardship look like then? Talent stewardship. Oh, talent stewardship. I think it's little things, you know, knowing about people, what they love to do, you know, whether it be, um, you know, not just about the work, it's about their holistic experience, you know, we had a team member who passed away this last year and it hit us really hard. Somebody that we worked with for 20 years and that's never, not some of us have worked with for 20 years. That's never happened before since I've been here and it, it hurt, you know, it hurt a lot, but we all, it also is a testament to the relationships that we have here. And um, you know what, we didn't know everything about her and we learned a lot after she passed. And I think that even, um, helps enhance our culture and she's not even here and she's helping to enhance our culture because, you know, you want to know all facets of everybody and you want to meet people where they're at. So many health issues happened this past year. I'm sure many other schools faced, you know, not only COVID, but, um, other, other issues and you really have to meet people where they are and give them the benefit of the doubt and play the long game because somebody did that with me and I'm still here. Well said. Break down the three P's for us then, and, and maybe if there are some um, ways you've been at Gonzaga, but I imagine you look at those as being generalizable approaches that if you were leading another organization, you might at least try to evaluate or frame up the potential through the same approach. So what should folks know about the three P's and uh, how that's evolved at Gonzaga? Well, I think, you know, everything at the end of the day does come down to the productivity or performance, you know, however you want to call that, you know, how much money you're raising from an advancement perspective. So um, you really do that by the right processes and the right people. And so what, what I think that we've seen over the last few years is there's been times where we're so focused on processes, you know, so in a real life situation, um, example, gift officers, right? They just have a lot of um, hard work to do with donors and they're very relationship focused. They don't want to get bogged down in processes. If we come at it from a process standpoint only, and we don't look at the people that are actually involved in that process, we look only from that lens, we're not going to get to the performance that we need to. And at the same time, you know, you can't just have great people that are good at relationship building without implementing the necessary processes to grow the pipeline um, and actually scale the work as well. So scalability is a buzzword <laughs> for us these days and how, you know, nobody has time to do all the things that we want to do. So learning where to scale and when to scale with the people that we have and also making sure that we have as efficient a process as possible. Yeah, scalability is a buzzword for us too, and and I think um, some of what you just said, I wanna I wanna press on a bit because we try to frame our work, and, and I'm sure you do as well. Is is let's not make it about the process or about the people. It, let's start with the donor, right? Let's start with the experience that we want to create, and then if we're going to create that compelling experience where it is personalized, where it is scalable and it generates results, then what are the processes that we're gonna need? And who are the people that we're gonna to need to execute on that? But like you just said, you could be an amazing fundraiser, but if you don't stick to the process playbook, you could still achieve great results, but how much potential are you leaving on the table? And at the same time, if you are just doing the process without that human empathy, um, you can miss miss opportunity as well. So it's that balance. Uh, and I do think sometimes we can, we can, I don't know, over index on one side or the other and, and, and make it a crutch. I mean, even with our own work, we had our race conference last week and it's a lot of fun. I love doing the production and, and the filming and the video and all of that, but it is also super important that we are incredibly disciplined in our follow-up. Otherwise, we just go and have this great experience, this great event, but it is going to take consistent, persistent, personalized follow-up. People aren't going to write me back on my first email or my second or respond <laughs> to my LinkedIn note unless you really earn it. And I think it's that balance of 
Um, we talk about polite persistence all the time. How do we bring that to fundraising, but also not make it an incredibly manual effort, right? That's where the systems and the technology can help, but you've yeah. got to have the three P's in place first. Yeah, absolutely. I a hundred percent agree with you. And, um, you know, not every person is, you know, has the same talents and gifts too. So a lot of times, trying to figure out and not every donor either, right? Like there is some sort of nuancing at times when we're talking about building portfolios or we're talking about how to get the best out of our team. Um, And, you know, oftentimes, I guess, you know, the way that, that I look at it is if our productivity isn't where we need it to be, it's likely that our processes need to be better or we need to look at our people. And it doesn't mean they're not doing the job. Maybe we need more. Maybe we need more roles to get there, you know? So usually it's one of those things and really trying to diagnose where that, what, what that is, is, and you're right, maintain that balance is so important. Well, uh, I really appreciate your perspective on all of this. I also meant to mention earlier that, that you do have, uh, that you have pursued additional certification and education around the field of coaching uh, leadership coaching specifically, you mentioned between the work you're doing at Gonzaga and the day job, and then the work uh, uh, with family and so forth, you're not doing a lot of individual coaching today or, or one-on-one coaching, but that you have done some of that in the past. And I would imagine most of our listeners have never had a coach, uh, at least as it relates to their career. I do find it ironic that growing up, we all had coaches or teachers and trainers in every discipline. And now we have to go through our career and just sort of figure it out on our own. Um, What should folks know about coaching who aren't as familiar in the career context? Oh gosh, Uh, coaching. So, you know, I, my background obviously is in counseling and, and I, you know, aspired and got additional certification in coaching, as you said. And so what was helpful to me is understanding the difference between counseling and coaching. Um, when I first got into that is the counseling is more like um, com- helping somebody go from dysfunctional to functional and coaching is helping people move from functional to optimal. So if you're looking at optimal performance or, you know, really reaching goals, that's where having a coach come in and help you uncover your blind spots, you know, what's holding you back, limiting beliefs are a lot of that. Um, so, you know, I did my own work on myself, um, and then I brought some of that to our team or we've hired outsourced and we brought coaching in, especially for somebody who wants to take the move from a middle level position to either, you know, further leadership or management, you know, I've learned in the past, just putting somebody in that role, they're not going to fully succeed. You know, they need that coaching and mentorship. Um, and sometimes people are resistant because we're talking about our weak spots. That's not a fun place to be, but I would certainly better know them and be able to know strategies to overcome, to get where I want to be, than just to sit where I am and not go forward, um, without knowing those. So how do you think about success in that realm? It's certainly a little bit more subjective, right? If I get a coach to help me run faster, we can measure my time to run a mile at the beginning. And then three months later, we can measure it again and say, wow, this coaching really paid off. What is the human capital equivalent of that? And do you have any examples that you look back on where you just say, wow, that coaching combined with work ethic and good attitude and the things that, you know, are maybe more intangible really transformed or accelerated or got that individual way closer to, to optimal. Mm -hmm. There's, there's, you know, different kinds of assessment tools, um, of course, that you can actually have more data around, whether it be like a 360 review. Um, I, my background is in uh, something called the energy leadership. So it's really kind of measuring where you're at in terms of your attitude towards life (laughs) and your engagement in life and work. Um, so there are certain ways that you can do that. I think that, um, it's really the personal about what are you trying to accomplish, getting really clear on that, and then um, finding and uncovering within each person those strategies. So um, a lot of times it is in, you know, they know their path now. They know what they're working towards. Sometimes it's as simple as that. Um, 
they, they, and it's a willingness by the person going in also a willingness. If it's a work situation for the supervisor to be supportive along the way. Um, there's so many different great programs out there. A lot of the universities that um, people are at, they might even have that available or they, like we have leadership development program here at GU that we've been able to put people through as well. So just real commitment to that growth. I love it. And um, yeah, commitment to growth and thinking about, right, employee lifetime value the same way you might think about donor lifetime value. It doesn't just happen. You got to work at it. And uh, it's a good reminder, you know, for me, uh, as we continue to invest in, in these areas. When we reconnected in May, you were incredibly excited, like I said earlier, about, about your results at Gonzaga, about some of the uh, very quantitative progress uh, in the annual fund at a time when many of your peers have struggled. And I'd be remiss to not let you give your team a shout out and share uh, some of those results and what you're, you're obviously so proud of about. Uh, but then also give us a sense of, you know, when you think about fiscal 22, 23, what are some other big ideas on the horizon? Yeah. So we went into fiscal year 21 knowing that our job was to raise annual funds, right? We And before fiscal year 21, before the pandemic, we were told through an assessment that we did with an outside partner. Um, we were, it's nothing that we didn't know, but we were reminded <laughs> Um, it was emphasized that our unrestricted giving really wasn't where it should be for um, compared to our peers. And so that wasn't necessarily a cultural thing for us, right? We were really excited working with donors to um, help build some buildings on campus, to give to scholarships. We were, that's really where we're comfortable at. And that case for unrestricted giving relied on you know, many $100 donors and $1,000 donors. And our board, you know, they were giving to other areas as well. So when this happened, we knew, hey, we've got to double down on this because when is there ever going to be a greater need for flexible funding, right? We didn't even know what expenses were going to come our way with COVID. Many schools, same boat, right? We knew there were testing. We had to shut down our study abroad campus and refund money, um, but it just continued, you know? And so our board more than ever before also understood that. So we capitalized on that opportunity to really help um, talk to them about, hey, you know, could you, would you be willing, maybe instead of giving to your scholarship or in addition to giving to your scholarship, could you help provide some of this flexible funding? And they were so gracious. They stepped up. We had a trustee emeritus member that stepped up to also help um, ask of his peers. And we doubled our annual fund in one year, never happened before. Um, and so we believed now that we can do that work. Um, and we, we really focused on that case for support. Some of it was retraining our gift officers and giving them the support and materials that they needed um, to do their job. And now, you know, it's more important than ever before that we just continue that mission critical funding is what we've, we've called it. So that's, that's gonna be what that's the word. That's the phrase you used when we reconnected. You said we had to position this as mission critical and, uh, and also that that staff getting the whole team rallied around it. It's not an afterthought. This is the core of what we're doing. Um, that sounds so simple. It's not. Maybe it was the external um, threat or, or challenge of COVID that, that created a bit of a rallying cry around it. How do we, in a hopefully more post-pandemic environment, how do you maintain that? How do you make sure it wasn't a one-time COVID boost? I'm sure that's top of mind for all of you right now. Yeah, that's a great question and one that we've wrestled with. So we're looking at everything from, you know, one, th one strategy that we did was change up our timing um, and make sure that we tried to have commitments before the fall to, you know, calendar year end from our our board, you know, because that's energy that we didn't want to be spending later in the year because they're close to us. So hopefully they would understand and commit that at the time. And it wasn't about them. It's more just about our own ask timing and strategy. The other, so we're going to continue that. The other thing so, so is almost, if you wait, if you wait till the end of the fiscal year to secure the commitments from your most loyal supporters, you're then just hurting cats and chasing things that probably are your most sure thing 
rock solid commitments. So just move those asks much sooner in the calendar. Yeah, it's simple and it's really simple. And maybe other schools are doing that for us. If we weren't, you know, we were going off of the donor's timeline because we are donor centered, but there's also, that's the other thing that we really learned is, you know, we've got to put our needs out there. We have to be talking about it. We definitely want to be donor centered, but if they don't know that this is the most critical need for us right now and timing is critical too, then, you know, we're not really um, owning our responsibility as fundraisers and owning our responsibility to this university and our students. So um, that was important. You are one of the many um, advanced professionals, your team, yourself as an individual, where from an innovation perspective, there are some constraints. You're in a large CRM conversion, and anytime that happens, it tends to be all hands on deck, and it, and it can make it a little bit harder to do some of that experimentation or entrepreneurial work that you talked about earlier. But I know you have been able to leverage new digital strategies. I know you've, you've invested heavily in Thank You, for example, to try to drive more authentic connections with your donors. I'd love to know more about what you've learned there, whether it's from a stewardship perspective or making a more personalized appeal, major gift use cases. I don't know the details, but I know that is one of the things that even in the midst of a big te technology transformation, you've been able to push forward with. Yeah, we have an incredible team that, you know, also is interested in taking risks and um, trying new things. We, we were able to um, implement a mobile application. So that was one thing we brought forward last year, um, trying to solve the problem of, you know, people aren't necessarily reading their emails all the time, um, or we don't know their emails. And so, and this is a less invasive, you know, they can turn on their notifications or not. So that was really exciting for us to do last year. Um, thank you absolutely was awesome for us, um, not only for our team, but also our academic leaders, um, our president to be able to, you know, record a message and we could send it out. Um, Tell me more about that. Cause I don't think, <laughs> Uh, you know, we have a lot of mutual partners with Thank You. We've got an integration with Thank You. I love the idea of personal college president to donor or academic leader to donor stewardship. Almost like, I don't know if you know the company Cameo out of Chicago, where you can like hire a you know celebrity to make a quick 60 yes. second video yeah. for your friend. Like our campus leaders are the celebrities of our campus. How do we work that into the donor experience? Tell me more about how you've operationalized that because it's not easy. Or maybe yeah. it is easy and people just don't realize how easy it is. The hardest part is you know, making the ask of our leadership who we know are very, very busy and then making sure they are equipped and comfortable and their staff is, you know, so um, we, we invested, we have a wonderful person on our team who is like our thank you guru and she sets us up and um, sometimes at a very short notice. Um, but she really helps get people ready and onboarded to that platform. And it's easy. It's really not that hard, but um, that's why I said the ask is the hardest thing. So making sure our processes, right. You talk about, you know, making sure we have, you know, easy directions. Um, we can easily get them set up. So we've used it for, you know, donor birthdays where we've all um, recorded a message and then it's been kind of spliced together and it goes out to that person. And, and can I ask Dory, cause I think, one of the real, there's a sliding scale of personalization, right? You could make a, let's call it generic message. Hi, it's Dory from the advancement team. I know it's your birthday and we just wanted to say happy birthday on behalf of you know the, the university. And you can use that to every donor who has a birthday and you could just send that out. And it's fine. And that's probably an improvement from a generic you know email that says happy birthday. But it is yes. so different than, hey, Dory, it's Brent here, the dean of the engineering school, and I know it's your birthday, and you've been a great supporter of this fund in the past, and we just wanted to write. Like, it's so, so subtle of a difference in the actual text, but it, I think it means a lot more in a time of mass personalization. So how do you balance that sort of Let's make it seem personalized versus actually getting a one-to-one -one message from that dean to this donor because of X, Y, Z reason. 
Well, it comes back to that scalability, right? You know, trying to figure that out. It's a great question. You know, we've used, we use students for a lot of the more generic stuff. We've used them also for, you know, scholarship recipients for our endowment reports. We did a lot of new things with delivering those over the last year. Um, and okay, I have to say our team was so creative. I, I remember over the last year or so they actually took thank you. I think they like did something like pulled all of the Joe's in our database and did a recorded message to Joe, <laughs> you know, it might've been Mike or I don't know, but that is, that is the right in between. So yeah, like, yes, creative. it's to you, Dory or Brent, <laughs> but also to the other Dory's and Brent. But yeah, I mean, that is the kind of stuff where, and, and this is where I do think it's the intersection of the data and the analytics, right? We have to be judicious with our time about when it really makes sense to ask the president to do the true one-to-one -one message or ask the dean to do the one-to-one -one message or when maybe we can get away with the sort of semi-personalized versus something that is more, you know, hopefully still good content, but it's not actually personalized and that's okay too. And it's like engineering all of that. I think we're just in the early innings of making that more streamlined and automated in this sector, but I think it has tremendous potential. Even the idea that someday, you know, let's say I make a donation to the football program and we have a student ambassador with the football program and anytime a gift fund equals football, then that yeah. ambassador is triggered. And now all of a sudden it could be really to me and we could have this army of personalized stewardship supporters. And I feel like that is gonna be a far more compelling future than you know, the phonathon or some of the more traditional ways that we've leveraged students. Yes, I totally agree. I think that it's exciting. And, and that just takes, you know, that willingness to try those new things, you know, to fail forward. Someone has you know, coined for a while. And I think that's so true. Love it. Well, in the spirit of failing forward, uh, what are some things that we're going to hopefully succeed at, but maybe fail at in the next, uh, you know, year or two? What are some of the risks or ideas that you know you're you're gonna you're gonna try to pursue as a team yeah oh gosh that is such a good question i i think you know finding that balance between the in-person and I, mean, I think honestly bringing back in-person events is a little bit of a a risk you know because we've never done this before and now you know vaccinations and requirements are um you know upon many of us and so that in itself is, is going to be interesting. And then balancing out, you know, the digital way that we've really engaged with people. Um, I, my biggest caution is that we not just go backwards. You know, we don't want to go default and it's so easy to do, right? Because it's, we're all ready to Cut off the schedule from fiscal year 19 and yep. let's run it back. Yep, exactly. And so we're really trying to not do that. Um, but there are really great things that we want to bring back. So um, it's hard to innovate. You know, we're, we are going through a, a CRM conversion um, and there's so much ahead there and finding the time and the space to help get our team prepared and ready for that. That's something that we're um, cautious about as well, but we know could, you know, help us leaps and bounds. I love it. Well, thank you so much for sharing your journey. Uh, it's so rare that we talk to someone who, attends a college, gets a master's degree, works as a side hustle to pursue the degree, and then goes on to have, you know, such a, um, uh, you know, such a wonderful career. And it's not like you're done. You've got a, a lot of time to do more good work. Um, but it's just been really, really neat to see that, that evolution. And I hope your team members enjoy getting a little bit more of, of the backstory I hope everybody uh, re-ups their life insurance with that perspective that you shared. Um, but I do want to make sure we give the opportunity for our audience to get in touch with you, Dory. What would you recommend? I know you're active on LinkedIn. Um, is that the best place or, or how else should folks connect with you? Yeah, LinkedIn is great. I love you know meeting new people and you know talking to new people. I really appreciate this opportunity, Brent, and you're so gracious, um, but I learned from you and so many others in the industry. So um, I just get to do the, the case, you know, copy and steal everything. <laughs> and um, also just have to give a shout out to my um, colleague and vice president, Joe Poss, wonderful leader who um, are, we are so blessed that if anybody ever gets the opportunity to cross paths with Joe, you are one lucky person. Well, on that note, 
uh, are we hiring? Are, what is the plan as far as, uh, you know, if there are real near-term opportunities and folks are excited about the momentum you all have, how, uh, what should we know about on the hiring front? We are hiring. Uh, so go to our website, go to gonzaga.edu. There's um, employment uh, in one of the categories. So go look, we should be posting a couple of positions soon. We have some openings coming up in annual giving for sure. We're also looking at um, adding potentially some alumni relations roles. So we are preparing for our next campaign, you know, not sure exactly when that will be, but we have a clear roadmap on what we need to do to get ready. And we have a great donor base and a great team. So I hope people look for opportunities. And for whatever it's worth, if you haven't been to Eastern Washington, as we reflect on our family trip in our Grinnebago RV and the 12,000 miles in 33 states, we had a terrific stay uh, right outside of Spokane. Uh, and Eastern Washington is a is a complete gem, uh, particularly in the fall when we were there. We had some amazing apple cider donuts and we stayed at a... Uh, unbelievable uh, apple orchard. And uh, so I'm sure there are great things to do all year round, but that was a particularly fun, fun vibe. I know. I think the secret's getting out about Spokane. It is, it is a wonderful place to be. All four seasons, um, great fall, great summer. If you like to snow ski, hike, bike, all of it, great restaurants. I should stop talking because I don't want the secret to get out. <laughs> well, and if you like basketball, I hear they do oh. that pretty well out there too. So yeah, March uh, and April are very fun for us and I busy. Love it. I love it. Dory, thank you so much for sharing your perspective. Uh, here's to the next 23 years at Gonzaga, and I look forward to being in touch soon. <laughs> Thanks, this Brent. I really appreciate it. Signing off with Dory Sontag, the AVP for Organizational Effectiveness at Gonzaga University. Thanks, everybody. Take care.